How's it going guys? I got absolutely wrecked this week. Wait until you hear some of these insane, crazy hands I played. First though, I need to grab a beer. Cheers guys. Before I jump into today's beer, let's just jump straight into the pot of the week because this shit was epic. We have a four-way pot, which ends up as a three-way all-in. Everybody just absolutely smashes the board. Um, you don't often see hands like this, so this is what makes poker exciting, right? We have a 2-5 game. It's a $10 straddle, and the button's going to open it up to $35. I am in the small blind with pocket fours. I call, so does the big blind, and so does the live straddle. So we are four-handed to the flop, which comes out ace, four, three with two spades. I have middle set here. I love it. Uh, I decided to check here. I think I might have made a mistake here with four players. I probably should just lead here because there's a good chance that someone has an ace and they're not going to fold an ace here. So I'd be getting value from that. There's also obviously straight and flush draws out there as well. I think the better play here is to just lead out four, four-handed with a hand this strong. Um, but I wasn't really thinking um, straight, I guess, and I checked. And it actually checks around. So... That's kind of interesting. The nine of hearts comes on the turn, and this is where things get super spicy. Um, I'm going to lead out here for $75 now for value. The big blind makes the call. Now the under the gun player who was the live 10 puts in a raise to $225. Now the button who was the original preflop raiser goes all in for $565. And I'm thinking, crap, what did I just run into? Um, it kind of smells like pocket aces, right? Because he checks back. Maybe he's slow playing uh, a, a huge monster hand. He could also have pocket nines and have just gone in there. I think pocket nines would check back. Um, he could also have pocket threes. I don't think he has five Ds. There are some uh, draws that he could have, although not a lot, right? Because the ace of spades is out there, so the, maybe like king, queen of spades? I don't, I don't know. Um, but I actually go in the tank here, and I really wanted to fold. I think that if we are heads up, I actually do make this fold. Um, or if the under the gun player who made it 225... Uh, was shorter stacked. I think I make the fold here. What made me decide to call is that I felt like I'm almost getting a free roll here because I don't think that the under the gun player who made a 225 is ever folding here. There is a small chance that I'm up against two bigger sets here, but that's very, very hard to, uh, to happen. Um, I think that the under the gun player is the player that's more likely to have like a some type of combo draw or or something like that or maybe two pair. And he covers me. So the side pot, if I win the side pot, I'm only losing a, about $200 here. And if I somehow am ahead and win this pot, it's a massive almost $3,000 pot. Plus, we don't know what the big blind player is going to do yet. He's still on the hand, too. He called the initial bet of $75 that I made. So um, I go in the tank and decide that this is a spot that I'm going to gamble in. Not sure if that's the, the, right, the right move or not, but I do feel like it's close to a free roll here. So I go all in as well for $965. The small blind... Um, Oh, excuse me, the big blind folds, and then the under the gun player calls. And we are up against pocket nines in the button. Kind of figured he either had aces or nines there. But the big blind, um, he actually folded ace three, and the under the gun player has ace nine. So it's two pair versus two pair versus set versus set. That's pretty insane right there. Um, the ace three folded though, so. Really, all we have to fade here is on the flop. All we had to fade was the case ace or the case nine. Unfortunately, that nine was like the perfect nut turn card for the button. Uh, kind of gross. 
But um, five of spades on the river. Luckily, nobody had a spade draw and or pocket deuces or something like that. Um, I do win the side pot, which was, again, it's, it's, a, it's about a $200 loss. So it's not terrible. Um, but man, that was that. How about that for an opening hand on the show? How often do you see a set versus set versus two pair versus two pair? And none of them were bottom two pairs. It was top two and aces up. That's that's crazy, man. That's that's insane. Uh, so that is just kind of an example of how my week went. Um, yeah, that that was just uh, it was a six spot. I, I I really think I'm going to fold there if if uh, the under the gun player doesn't have me covered. Um, and you guys have seen me fold sets before on the flop, just in the most recent episode, actually. So yeah, that was a gross spot. Um, Definitely uh, something that makes you need to drink. Uh, speaking of which, today's beer is Ghostfish Brewing Company Lunar Harvest Pumpkin Ale because it is Halloween week. Happy Halloween, guys. Um, I'm generally not a huge fan of pumpkin ales, but there is there are some really good pumpkin ales out there. Uh, my favorite one, personally, is Buffalo Bale's pumpkin ale and to me uh no other pumpkin ale I've, I've ever had comes close to it so uh i'm pretty critical when it comes to pumpkin ales a lot of them honestly taste like crap this one is um definitely not as crappy as it could be though so this is actually a pleasant surprise it's just probably not my favorite beer but it's it's doable you know so that's today's beer. Um, it's I think five percent alcohol. It's got you could taste like the spices in it. Um, it just tastes like a holiday beer, like cinnamony. Um, yeah, like kind of like what I don't know. I, I I don't know how to explain it. It just tastes like cinnamony or like herbally shit. I don't know. Pumpkin. <laughs> Let's jump into today's good or bad. It's a folding situation. Is this a good fold or a bad fold? It comes in a 2-5 no-limit game at the Stars again. And there is a lot of action that night. Uh, we have two limpers. I'm in the low jack with king jack of hearts. I raised it up to 25. I think I could have raised more. But the way that this game was going is that people just weren't really folding pre-flop. And I didn't want to make the pot too big multi-way um so I, but i did want to raise it a little bit so i, I just chose 25 here it, it's kind of a weird spot um the cutoff and the under the gun plus one player call the 25 so do the uh blinds and the, the limpers i think we're seven handed going to a flop which comes out nine six six with two hearts i have a flush draw and two overs and the small blind leads out now oh important thing here the small blind gave off a tell pre-flop. Um, after I made it 25 and everyone was calling the 25, when it got to him, he looked like he wanted to raise, but then decided to just call. So I'm already thinking, oh, he might have like a mediocre pocket pair, maybe pocket 10s, pocket 9s, pocket jacks, or something like that. Um, it's important because as this hand plays out, I use that tell to kind of determine where I'm at in the hand. So now the small blind's leading out, right? $50 into like seven players. He's got to have a strong hand to do this. He, he can't have garbage and just doing this. So I think it makes sense now that he does have a hand like pocket tens or pocket jacks here maybe. And, you know, he likes the low flop. Uh, I don't personally think that leading out here though in that spot is the best because seven way, someone's probably going to have a six, it seems like. Um, and if I do bet, I think I would bet more, but he chooses 50, which is a pretty small size, uh, given that there's already like 175 in this pot. The big blind makes the call here. He could be calling here with his flush draws, a nine, a, a six. Although I do think that if he has a six with seven handed, uh, I think he's going to put in a race here just to protect it against the flush and straight draws. Um, 
And and also the small line too would be betting his six X's also. But again, I just don't think he has a six here because I think he has a pocket pair based on that read. Um, so yeah, the big line is more likely to, I think, have a flush draw or a straight draw or a nine here. I'm going to call with my flush draw and then uh, three more players call behind. So we're still six-handed in this pot. And the pot is growing pretty fast here. Let's see, there's um, like 425 in the pot now. Four diamonds comes on the turn. Um, not a good turn card for me, but I still have my flush draw. Uh, we're still six-handed. Small blind now bets out $100. I think he's probably overvaluing his his mediocre overpair, like tens or jacks here still. The big blind calls 100 again, and this is kind of where alarms go off in my head because I said it on the flop that he probably has a 9x or some type of draw here. And I'm thinking there's also three players still behind me. I actually end up folding here. And the reason why I fold here is because I really think that there's a high probability that the big blind is calling with an ace high flush draw. And even and even if he's not, there's still a small possibility that someone behind me has an ace high flush draw. And I'm looking at the um I'm looking at 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 all the reverse implied odds here. If I make the call here and then hit a flush on the river and I'm second best, there are some potential full houses out there too, right? I could end up losing a lot of chips here, even though I'm getting 6.25 to 1 odds to call and see my flush draw. So that's the reason why I made a fold here. Um, we do get to see how the hand plays out because two more players behind me end up making the call. So they are going to a river which does, in fact, uh, come out as a 7 of hearts. And I'm thinking, please, someone have the ace high flush draw here. Otherwise, I'm going to hate myself. <laughs> the small blind now checks. And now the big blind bets. He gets two callers. He gets uh, two callers here. And um, sure enough, the big blind has ace 10 of hearts. The small blind had pocket jacks. So I was right about both of them. And I had no idea what the other players behind had. But uh, yeah, that was just a, a really interesting spot i thought because it's pretty rare that you're getting 6.25 to 1 pot odds uh on a flush draw but you have to fold or decide to fold because you're probably going to get stacked um or lose a lot of chips from reverse implied odds against a higher draw and i just felt like the, the chances there with that many players in the pot someone had to be drawing to the flush also someone had to have the nut flush draw and my second nut flush draw just wouldn't be good. So uh, thank thank you. Thank God for uh, making the right fold there. But what do you guys think? We can't be results oriented. Do you think that it is a good fold getting 6.25 6 to 1 odds? Or do you make that call and then have to deal with it on the river? Let me know in the comments. This beer's kind of growing on me. It's um, it is good. Uh, it has good spices. All right, so um, let's talk about what would you guys do? What would you guys do? Normally, I have a hand to discuss for this. This week, we are doing something a little bit different. Uh, Doug Polk put out a tweet asking a question with a poll, asking if you spot a very noticeable tell on someone. Are you ever going to tell them about it? Under or what under what circumstances are you going to tell them? Uh, if they're super nice, or if it's someone that you're never going to play with again? And um, I thought it was an interesting question because for me, I don't think I'm ever telling anyone if they have a tell. The only circumstance I could think of is, well, there's maybe two circumstances. Number one would be if I'm backing that person and I have some type of financial interest uh in that person's success and i 
think that they have a very noticeable tell, then I'm going to tell them because I want that person to win and make me money and not lose money based on that tell, right? Second reason I think is, um, and by the way, that first uh, scenario is very rare because I don't really back any players. <laughs> Second is if I'm like really good friends with the person off the poker table. If it's someone that I just know through poker, like a, they're kind of like a colleague, you know, that like, you don't see quarterbacks in the NFL trading each other's playbooks, right? Just to be nice. Um, at the end of the day, this is a competition. This is a game that we're playing, and we're trying to win each other's money. So if I think you have a tell, I'm going to remember it and try to use it to my advantage as an exploit. Um, the other thing that I thought about was if you were to tell that person, you have to have a lot of trust in that person, right? Because what if they now use that tell against you as a reverse tell later on in a big spot? Knowing that you know that they have this tell and they might now do it on purpose to uh, exploit you. I didn't really see any uh, one in the comments uh, talk about that. So it's just something that popped up to me. What would you guys do though? Um, and under what circumstances would you guys tell someone about their tell or just never? I thought it was an interesting question, especially coming from Doug, who um, I don't think a professional player should ever tell anyone about their opponent's tells, unless it's under those two cir circumstances. I might be forgetting of other circumstances, so if you think of some other ones, then uh, you know, leave a comment. I'm curious and interested to hear about it. Anyways. Should we go into bluffology? Now, in the past few episodes, uh, I've been basically breaking down bluffs that I made. But today I got something different. We're going to do some reverse bluffology. And this is basically me playing a hand where I'm breaking down whether or not my opponent is bluffing and if my ace high is good. Uh, so here we are in a 2-5-10 game, and the under the gun player is, a live, is the live 10. I'm under the gun plus one. I raise it up to $40. It's going to fold all the way to the big blind who calls 40. The live 10 folds. So there's 90 in the pot. We're heads up. I have ace king with the ace of clubs. Flop comes out queen eight three with two clubs. Um, the big blind checks. I continue for $45. I think that this is a good flop to continue with. The queen is good for my range. I have backdoor nut flush draws. I also block the net flush so um yeah this board doesn't really connect a whole lot other than the flush draw he calls a 45 the turn is a deuce of hearts now i want you guys to take a look here at the big blind uh, stack size because it's very important normally on this deuce of hearts i'm probably going to double barrel um as a bluff here but Number one, I think ace high has plenty of showdown here on this board. And number two is if I were to double barrel here, it puts it's it's kind of a tough spot because my opponent can just jam on me so easily and I'd have to fold. Um so I feel like if I do double barrel, it'd have to be an overbet all in. And I just don't think that it's worth doing that with Ace King because Ace King still has showdown value. So, and plus I could still improve with the Ace or King on the river if I am behind. So I check back here, and it's interesting that I do this because it kind of caps my range now because it makes it very unlikely that I have a queen here or anything, right? In fact, the top of my range is probably Ace King now, and my opponent probably knows this. So it now kind of opens the door for him to bluff with a wider range on the river, I think. And I'm thinking about that already as his hand is playing out. So when the seven of clubs hits the river, um, and he now puts out a bet of $90, which is almost half his stack, I know how to decide, is my ace king here good? Did I basically... Um, trigger him to make a bluff here because I checked back the deuce of hearts on the turn. Uh, he can't have the nut flush, obviously. We block that. So if he doesn't have the nut flush draw, could he have a, a weaker flush draw? Yeah, he could. 
but I just is less likely when, when I have a club in my hand. There are a lot of potential straight draws out there, like Jack 10, 10, 9 um, out there that miss completely and they don't have showdown value. So in order to win the pot, he would have to bet there. I don't think an 8 is value betting here because one of the few hands that I probably would check back the turn is, in addition to Ace-King, would be a flush draw. Um, and it got there. So I basically have to decide, you know, if, if I thought my hand was good on the flop, it's probably still good here on the river. So I make the call here, and he just instant mucks it. I don't even have to show him that I have Ace-King. Um, but, yeah, and the other thing is, if he did have a value hand like a flush or two-pair or, or king-queen or something like that, I really think that he's going to bet more than 90. In fact, I think he probably just goes all in here because he's it's about a one-to-one -one stack to pot ratio at that point. Um, so why not go for max value with your stack size? So I just don't think he has any value hands here. I think, I don't know what he had for sure, but I think he probably had like Jack 10 or something like that. It, it just makes the most sense, right? Um, so yeah, that is the reverse bluffology. Uh, sometimes you just got to make some hero calls. The WPT has announced the first half of their 2024 schedule. schedule. It is season 22. It has three U.S. main tour stops. Seminole, Choctaw, and Thunder Valley. Thunder Valley, my home casino. Really looking forward to that one in, I forget, I think it was in March or April. So 3,500 uh, WPT. They also have four European stops, primarily on the WPT Prime Tour. Two stops in Asia, in Vietnam and Cambodia, Australia, New Zealand. And they even have a cruise in the springtime, which sounds really fun. It's got an 1,100 WPT Prime event, as well as a 5K, 1 million guarantee um, main event. I think that probably leaves from Florida and goes around the Caribbean or something. Looks super fun. I don't know if I could afford to do that, but um, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, but, you know, I'm a big fan of the WPT. Oh, I don't mean to brag or anything, but it would be cool to win another trophy. Um, other news, we have a shutdown in Detroit. Uh, MGM Grand and Motor City Casino poker rooms are shut down uh, this past week because employees i think there's over 3700 uh workers who have basically walked out they're basically on strike because their workloads need to be reduced and return to pre-pandemic levels um so i guess the detroit properties laid off a lot of workers um during covid like everywhere else did um you know when the lockdown hit and since covid has you know passed and everything they didn't really rehire uh the same staff levels as pre-pandemic and so now the workers that are left feel like they're being overworked and not compensated so um yeah detroit poker is kind of shut down right now and all three of the main major casinos out there are like limited uh operations right now so they're losing a lot of money hopefully uh the worker I, i'm i'm on the side of the workers i hope they get what they want and they definitely deserve to you get paid more i think and reduced hours or something uh let's see what else we got oh uh, i guess that is the end of the show it feels like that was a quick one uh we can rate this beer so hmm, you know i said <clears throat> pumpkin ales for me are a hit or a miss i am going to lean on the hit side this is probably one of the better pumpkin nails I've had. Um, something fun that my old uh, roommate and I used to do is we used to blindfold a beer test and have like a bracket. And something that we used to do every fall during uh, this time of year was do a blind tasting uh, pumpkin ale uh, bracket. And every year that Buffalo Bills beer that I mentioned earlier always wins. Um, we never had this one in the bracket though. This is just something I kind of like saw for the first time uh, when I was at Bevmo, I think, a couple weeks ago. Uh, so I decided to get and try it out. 
I think this one would have competed well in the bracket, um, but it's just not the same. So I am going to say that this is like a 7.9. It's good, though. Uh, I'm definitely going to drink all four cans, probably tonight. Cheers, guys. By the way, I do have a tournament vlog coming up this week. Stay tuned for that.